This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not dispense medical advice. Always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health providers if you have any questions regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking such advice because of something you have heard on this podcast. Welcome to a show that we like to call Prostate Cancer Real Talk. Did you know that in the U.S., one out of every eight men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime? One out of eight. And black men are 50% more likely to develop prostate cancer in their lifetime and twice as likely to die from the disease. But hey, we're not here to quote statistics and tell you how tough prostate cancer can be. Rather, we are here to create a supportive community of survivors a place where we can discuss the real-life coping methods from the perspective of a married couple who are living through it day by day. Our hosts, L and Shay. This is Prostate Cancer Real Talk. In this episode, we welcome back Dr. Adam Murphy. Dr. Murphy is a distinguished professor of health equity research in urology preventative medicine, cancer epidemiology, and prevention at Northwestern Medicine in Chicago. He has been studying the health disparities faced by minorities in prostate cancer, looking at the role of vitamin D deficiency, genomics, and biomarkers in disparities for men at risk of and already diagnosed with prostate cancer. Dr. Adam joins us today to further his community outreach and to continue his mission of education and prevention. Now let's welcome back Ellen Shea. Thank you very much, Dennis, for that great introduction, and welcome to today's show. Hello, Shay. How are you today? I'm good, Al. How are you? Good, good. We're very excited to have Dr. Murphy back with us again. Uh, Dr. Murphy uh, has been with us previously, and he, as Dennis uh, indicated, is a specialist, uh, a urologist, but he also is a researcher uh, focused on uh, research for prostate cancer among black, African American and Black men. So, uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Murphy. Hi, thank you all for having me again. So, Dr. Murphy, uh, t- today we're going to talk about uh, prostate cancer and the fact that it has st- strangely increased for the first time in 20 uh, years. The incidence of prostate cancer has increased for the first time in 20 years, and we want to get your perspective on that. Uh, But before uh, we get into that, you were with with us previously, and the topic of our discussion was African-American men and prostate cancer. So before we delve into the uh, most recent report that shows the increase of prostate cancer, why don't you give us an overview or a highlight your perspectives on African-American men and prostate cancer? Okay. There are some good things that have been happening in that space in the sense that several studies have shown that African-Americans, when they are in good care, high-quality care, or in the setting of a clinical trial, that African-American mortality rates uh, go to be very similar to rates of whites. Uh, So good access to quality care uh, is an important thing that uh, really um, does make the playing field more even. Now that increased risk of getting prostate cancer does not go away with that, obviously. So that increased risk of having acquired uh, prostate cancer in your lifetime, that does not get better because you're in a different neighborhood or you go to a different hospital. But if you you have to face it, it is nice to know that the rates of prostate cancer uh, death goes down with good care. So you you say good care, um, and I'll use myself as as an example, as I do do frequently, being a prostate cancer survivor. Um, one of the things that I always point to when I'm talking to people is the importance of regular uh, screening, um, and we can talk about the age in which that should happen, particularly among uh, black men. But as for me. Uh, I attribute my successful outcome uh, t- to having prostate cancer as early det- regular screening, early detection, and excellent treatment, which I was treated at uh, Northwestern Hospital, uh, where, where Dr. Murphy happens to reside. So very pleased to say that. But um, 
Talk a little bit, if you could, about the importance of regular screening uh, and at what age we should become, become screened and then, you know, the treatment after that, how important that is. You, you all are touching on really interesting and still controversial topics to a degree, but I will say um, that most people believe that you should get um, screened at some point in your 40s because, in your early 40s, because it predicts uh, who will actually die of it, of the disease. So if you are, your PSA in your 40s are above median level, you know, where 50% of the people will hit, if you're in that Below that, you are you only have like a 10% chance of dying of prostate cancer. You're going to capture like 90% of the f- people who will have died of prostate cancer above that threshold. And because of that fact, uh, it allows you to kind of tailor how often you screen based off of your PSA uh, in early age. So there's a lot of benefit to getting uh, screened in your early 40s. Um, there are five different groups that I think are kind of credible groups that give you prostate cancer screening recommendations and they have all of them vary a little bit about how often, whether the rectal exam should be included, should you handle blacks and people with family history or genetic risk differently than other groups. Um, I would tell you that um, the American Urological Society, sorry, the American Urological Association uh, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network kind of have the most nuanced uh, recommendations. I tend to stick with those because I'm a urologist and because I feel like it's very well respected in the urology com- community. Um, and so that answer is in, in your 40s, you should be doing it between age 40 and at least age 70. Some people will go up to age 76, and then if you are healthy, you can continue to do it even beyond age 76. The Promise Registry is an exciting new partner of Prostate Cancer Real Talk. Promise is a registry of prostate cancer patients who want to learn how their genetics can affect their treatment options. To learn more, visit prostatecancerpromise.org. So, Shay, do you have any questions that you'd like to pose to Dr. Murphy? I do, because I know you're really interested in researching. And I always wonder, like, why do you think black men are so hesitant about clinical trials? Like, what are the myths? Because there are, you know, even with the pandemic, like a lot of black people didn't want to get vaccinated. So why do you think black men are hesitant about participating in clinical trials? Um, it probably is our culture in the sense that, so I got to watch the, um, pandemic play out. And I think I told you this before, but I kind of come off as bicultural on social media. So sometimes the algorithms figure out that I'm black and they'll show me black <laughs> directed <laughs> videos. And sometimes because of my, where I'm going to school and who's in my network, they'll think I'm white, not because of my look, but because right. of who I know. Right. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I'll get two different streams coming to me. Mm-hmm. And so the black half of me gets, a lot of videos talking about um, kind of conspiracies, people putting microchips into the vaccine to track people, people try to use it as a form of genocide to kill people off. Uh, and then there's somebody with a suit coat on, a PowerPoint in a closet, and they become like the expert over right. science, uh, over their own physicians, the guy in the closet with the laptop is literally the expert. And uh, I think there's a lot of reason for that suspiciousness in the black community because we have had um, really bad outcomes in uh, terms of the way that we're treated in the healthcare system oftentimes is very paternalistic. Mm -hmm. It isn't respecting your autonomy to help you engage in your own decision-making. That's a reason for distrust. The other thing is that whenever someone has a big information asymmetry from you, meaning that they know way more about the product than you do, there's a little bit of reason for distrust because there's just stuff that that you don't know about. And in business, they call it buyer beware, right? Right. But in medicine, doctors know a lot more (laughs) than patients do about, you know, the treatments, the options, 
which one they would prefer for you and the way that they kind of uh, decide to talk to you about it, it's up to them to give you that information. Mm -hmm. So I think there's just a lot of reasons for that mistrust. I also think that we have fewer doctors and nurses in our community to kind of build up our health literacy so that we kind of come into our appointments along with, I'm sorry, armed with a little more knowledge to, to have those conversations with our doctors. Okay. So what do you think we can do? Because, you know, our whole purpose is to try and like kind of be preventative a little bit and get knowledge out to people. So is there anything that you would recommend that perhaps black doctors or doctors in general or people like Elle and myself do to uh, try and bring black men to or black people in general to these clinical trials, regardless of the cancer they may be facing? I think there's a lot of reasons for people to engage in clinical trials because the myths on clinical trials, which is how you started this question, were really scary, right? Mm -hmm. That you would get people who are black maybe shifted to the control arm, the placebo arm, right? Mm -hmm. Not right. drug, not getting a real treatment and, um, you know, saving the, the treatments for other people. That was a belief. Why are you putting me on placebo trials? Or there was a preponderance of early phase one trials where they actually are just kind of testing the toxicity of drugs. That's where minorities tended to be best recruited. Because in these drugs that were not really trying to cure you, mm -hmm. they were trying to figure out what the toxicities are of the drug are, the dangers of the drug are. And that's where we were getting, you know, most recruitment. So I think that there's a lot more regulation in research, a lot more ethical approval issues that all science goes through now. Mm -hmm. Like at our center, we have a scientific review committee within the cancer center that before they even get to go to the ethics committee for research called our IRB. So that increased level of regulation means that you're not likely to get abused uh, or treated unfairly in the setting of a trial. And in fact, it standardizes your treatment so much so that your prostate cancer mortality rate is the same as if you're black or white. Okay. In a trial because of that level of regulation. So um, let's shift the conversation to this um, latest American Cancer Society report mm -hmm. that indicated an increase in uh, prostate cancer. Of course, you know, th they are monitoring various types of cancer, cervical cancer, colon cancer, and whatnot. And in general, uh, and I'm not just going to try to recap the report, but generally speaking, um, the 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 occurrence of cancer in the general population over time has improved. Uh, it, you know, there's less and less incidence of cancer. However, uh, this latest report indicated that for the first time in 20 years, there was an increase in the incidence of prostate cancer. So. Could you give us your perspective on why you think that's happening? And then what can we do collectively, uh, Shay and I and, and, and our podcast, uh, what can we do to help solve that issue? Yes. So this is, this is an interesting statement, again, you all are asking, because there's two sides to the story. So the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force was charged with making recommendations to the government about what Medicare and Medicaid should, should cover, right? Mm -hmm. For screening services. And because of the fact that most men who had low risk prostate cancer were being treated with surgery or radiation, um, that over treatment of cancer and all the side effects that came along with the, those treatments, the erectile dysfunction, the bowel, irritation, the urinary frequency where you pee too much or, or the, the loss, of, um, uh, you having some anemia from the radiation, having some fatigue from androgen deprivation therapy sometimes, all the things that came along with those treatments, they felt like there was over-treatment and over-diagnosis of prostate cancer. And so because of that mismatch between the benefit versus risks, they said, stop screening. Right, mm -hmm. being, and they gave it a, a, a D grade out of an A, B, D, F. They gave prostate cancer screening with PSA a D. Wow! Because of the because it was overused. 
and they said there was not the 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 harms were not outweighed. Were outweigh they were outweighing the benefits. Okay. Uh, and so that happened. And so what would ex- you expect to happen is that if you stop screening for prostate cancer with PSA, you're going to detect people later when they're symptomatic, and you're going to get more aggressive disease because that's what you're detecting, right? You're not screening anymore. You're going to find mm-hmm. when they're symptomatic, when they are having weight loss, bone pain, or they have some urinary symptoms and someone feels a nodule in their prostate, they get prostate. Anyway, you get symptomatic prostate cancer, and therefore you're no longer curable oftentimes. Mm-hmm. The mortality rate goes up. So people who were pro that decision really thought this is great because this is what's supposed to happen. You avoided treating all those people who did not develop those symptoms. They die of other things. And only the people who were, who were um, going to get that prostate cancer got it, right? Mm-hmm. That was the concern. That was what they wanted to see. And epidemiologists are, were happy with that outcome because you spared people with low risk prostate cancer who would die of something else anyway from having to even know that they had prostate cancer and therefore they live their life living happily ever after. That's the theory. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now the, the danger of that was that at the same time, urology was, was building data on the, the strengths of acts of surveillance for early prostate cancer, where you could safely watch people over time by following their PSAs, mm-hmm. on their rectal exams, getting repeat prostate biopsies. And then now with MRI and biomarkers, you can even use those tests to see if the cancer is getting worse genomically with their, the way their genes are expressed in the tumor, or if by imaging their tumors are growing or becoming uh, concerning in other areas of the prostate. So we think that they threw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. And and got rid of PSA screening right when we were about to get really great at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I disagree with that study because, you know, the PSA testing is what saved Elle's life, what saved my husband's life. Because yeah. at the point of his surgery, his uh, cancer has, was just inside of the prostate getting ready to spread outside of the prostate. So had he not had the PSA testing, we wouldn't have known that. Yes. So what, what the epidemiologists are, are weighing is the few people that they would say are like uh, your husband versus the thousands of, well, hundreds of people who are, have low risk disease who now have been suffering with urinary incontinence or erectile dysfunction for the rest of their life for a treatment that they didn't need. Right. Right. So that was the way that no one, I hear you. And, and right. Right. Stories that are just like what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And so the government needs to make decisions about how they invest their money mm-hmm. intelligently. Right. Right. So what's the risk benefit for them from a financial standpoint and from a public health standpoint? Just a reminder to ensure that you stay up to date on the latest episodes from Prostate Cancer Real Talk. Don't forget to hit that subscribe and like button. Yeah. So, Dr. Murphy, one of the key, you know, when when I um, open up and talk about my 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 prostate cancer experience with people, I'm continuously amazed at the number of men who say, "Oh, yeah, you know, I had that you know, pr- pr- procedure two years ago." I mean, it's just amazing to me the number of guys that I know, okay? Uh, one guy happened to be uh, one of my supervisors that I used to report to. Um, it is just, it's just amazing how many people will open up and start talking about this once you reveal your situation to them. Yeah. Um, there's, there's kind of a, a, I don't know, it's almost like an embarrassment. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to achieve with this podcast is to open up the dialogue. Um, two of the things that really make the prostate cancer experience somewhat of a secret to people um, are the, the sexual impacts that it has on, on men 
and also the urinary incontinence that it has and whatnot. And then sometimes make a incredibly faulty decision about, you know, continuing their manhood, so to speak, at a hundred percent level versus living. Okay. What is your uh, experience with talking to men who are making that decision as to whether they're going to continue um, um, their lifestyle or they're going to have this thing handled and it may cause some, you know, some, some issues in their, their personal life. I love that you brought this up. I, I feel like um, one thing that urologists have not been great at and doctors in general is assessing patients' values. What you're speaking to is um, what you value. You you have a lovely wife, you have a beautiful home, you have a good quality of life, and you have a enough excess that you can have a side mission to do a podcast and, and enlarge it. And so on balance, I would, this is how I conceptualize you, uh, you feel like even if you had to sacrifice sexual function or maybe even urinary function, that the quality of life that you have from the other parts of living will make up for that. But there are the, the let the good time roll kind of guys <laughs> who's, and we know them. Yes. They may be your drunk uncle. <laughs> <laughs> but, or some cousins. I'm not going to, you know, name mine. But, um, those folks put a higher premium on yes. the ability for them to have sex yes. as part of either defining their happiness, their stress relief, their sense of masculinity, um, their sense of bonding, their sense of power, right? There's a lot of reasons for people, and this is even stronger in the gay and bisexual men community, by the way, mm-hmm. where sex is uh, maybe a wife who's postmenopausal can forgive not having sex as her um, menopausal issues cause some issues with sex, which make make it painful, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily happen to males. So uh, in gay relationships, for example, they still want to be active, right? In their 60s and 70s, definitely in their 50s. Uh, And so because of that difference in priority on, on sex, and sexual function, other people may view that as worth dying for. Hey guys, this is L. Did you know that during the treatment of prostate cancer, our genes may be our most powerful tool? That's why the Promise Registry was formed, and that's why I joined. To learn more, go to prostatecancerpromise.org. That's prostatecancerpromise.org. So um, we attended an event where you were a speaker a couple weeks ago at Northwestern Medicine that focused on various elements of prostate cancer research, uh, you know, kind of what's going on in the in the industry. And one of the subjects that came up was, you know, some new treatments uh, that became av- available um, with biomarkers. And uh, one of the one of the uh, topics was this new treatment, Plavitco. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with that and how comfortable you are discussing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that no, that new treatment procedure and about this specific drug and and what it does benefit wise for men so- and for researchers and doctors. <laughs> so that was the Prostate Cancer Foundation's Patient Summit led by Dr. Ashley Ross in Northwestern. I got to be one of the speakers. It was great to see you there. <laughs> um, I love seeing my people in the audience <laughs> when I had to talk, especially. Um, I would say Plavicto is a cool thing because uh, most prostate cancers, about 86% of them will have a molecule called prostate-specific membrane antigen, which is different than PSA, prostate-specific antigen. This one is actually in the outer uh, lining or the coating of the cell membrane. So you can detect this PSMA molecule on the surface of most prostate cancers and even normal prostate tissue. 
So if prostate tissue, prostate cancer cells spread and find themselves in other areas of the body, this, uh, you can use antibodies, you know, from your own, uh, like an immune system antibody to go and bind that, that PSMA molecule. So if prostate cancer cells find themselves in the bone or the lung or the liver, um, you can see that on a CAT scan that's overlaid with a PSMA PET scan. So the way that they do it is that they have the antibody to PSMA and it's linked to a radioactive tracer, small radioactive tracer, not enough to cause cancer or, or you know, make you go crazy or anything like that. Just a little bit of, of radiation so that we can see it with a radiation counter. So when you overlay the, the CT scan or MRI in Northwestern with the PSMA scan, you can see exactly in the body where uh, prostate cancer cells are in the majority of people with prostate cancer. And so they're bringing, uh, that's, so that's just a PSMA molecule. Now what Plavicto is doing is weaponizing that by finding those areas where PSMA is being um, produced on the cell surface and they're tar targeting dangerous levels of radiation to that uh, marker now so that it can kill the tumor where it lies. Oh, wow. So, so it's like a way to uh, be more specific in your kill, whereas in the past, you basically would have just ways to suppress uh, the tumor with androgen deprivation therapy, taking away the testosterone from the body. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, or you can radiate or cut out prostate tumors, right? Uh, but now there's all these little, what's called micrometastatic disease deposits, where it's too small in a lymph node, for example, mm -hmm. for the scans to pick it up, but Pluvicto can pick it up because wow. there's enough there to go kill. Um, so it, it's been life extending in, in trials, uh, and it, it, it's been reducing, it can reduce your um, PSA levels uh, when you're on it. Uh, it seems to be able to reduce the rate of progression, how fast the tumor is moving. So it's been nice to see a new treatment being added to the uh, you know, repertoire of the tools we have now for prostate cancer, advanced prostate cancer. To learn more about Plavicto, please visit our website, prostatecancerrealtalk.com and click on Plavicto, learn more. To find out more information on the guests you just heard or previous guests and a list of prostate cancer Real Talk episodes, visit our website, prostatecancerrealtalk.com. And if you have a question, comment, or if you would like to share your story, send Ellen Shea an email, lnshay at prostatecancerrealtalk.com. That's L-E-L and Shay, S-H-A-Y, at prostatecancerrealtalk.com.